Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture on Northern Baroque art, which is sort of connected to many of the themes that we've been talking about in Unit 3. So Northern Baroque art is going to have a lot of similarities to the Southern Baroque art, but also some key differences. Uh, starting with this image here on the very front, uh, begin, uh, first slide of the lecture, so this is called the Fall of Phaeton and it is by a really famous Baroque artist, Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, this piece of work is located here in the United States in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. But you can already start to see some of the uh, relevant Baroque characteristics. For example, the drama and the emotion, um, the, the sort of diagonal angles, the busyness, the energy, the movement, right? So take a moment to look at this painting here and consider what about it strikes you as traditionally Baroque based on what we've already learned. When you've had a chance to do that, maybe you can pause, think about it, jot some things down. We can move on to the next slide. So let's talk about some of the general characteristics we see in Northern Baroque art. First of all, there's going to be a, be a plurality of patronage. So what this means is that there are going to be a greater variety of patrons than just the Catholic Church. Now in Southern Baroque art, we saw that the Catholic Church was the primary patron. But again, in Northern Baroque art, we will see a greater variety in patronage. This includes absolute monarchs, the powerful merchant classes, members of the nobility and the bourgeoisie. So there's a greater diversity. Uh, yes, the Catholic Church will still be a patron in some of the regions where they are present in Northern Europe. There's also going to be a greater demand for art in Northern Europe, especially in the Netherlands, where there is a vibrant and wealthy merchant class. Um, remember that art still equals wealth and power, and so art was still very much a status symbol, and we'll talk about how having art in your home was, uh, was a way of communicating your wealth and your power and your status in a society. Now, another important factor in Northern Baroque art is the decline of papal power in the mid to late 17th century would encourage different subject matter. So the Thirty Years' War in the mid 17th century and the Peace of Westphalia that ended the war was actually really damaging to the power of the Catholic Church in Central and Northern Europe because it confirmed the, the uh, longevity of Protestantism in a lot of ways. So the Catholic Church simply just is not as influential in Northern Europe. So what this means is that subject matter is not going to be as dominated by the, by the biblical and sort of Catholic themes that we saw dominate Southern Baroque art. So Catholicism is, uh, is weakened. That's going to encourage more secularism. Also, another influ uh, influential factor was the scientific revolution. So we haven't talked about the scientific revolution, but it's essentially the development of science, and it starts to become more mainstream in the 17th century. And this will also contribute to the secularization of art. And finally, some of the Protestantism of Northern and Northern Europe discouraged religious art. You can, this might remind you of the Northern Renaissance and how we saw more of that safe secularism. So this means Northern Baroque art is not only going to have a greater variety of the patrons, but it's also going to have a greater variety of subject matter. So there's going to be more portraits, more landscapes, still life, and basically just different scenes, more of that safe secularism. And also Northern Baroque will primarily be paintings. There really was little to no sculpture, because uh, remember sculpture, especially marble sculpture, is better suited to a Southern European climate. There's not going to be any frescoes. These were mostly oil paintings, especially the things that we look at in today's lecture. It's almost all going to be oil paintings. Now, of course, there is some architecture, 
Uh, Versailles is a good example of Northern Baroque architecture, and that still so shows us that uh, more of those traditional Baroque qualities, if you think about Versailles, of course, is really grand and ornate and opulent and, and impressive and expansive. So that theme could was often still present, especially in the architecture, that idea that Baroque art was, was, was utilized by monarchs to communicate their power. So Versailles would be a great example of that. So this is a really useful chart that I actually borrowed from Miss Sheets in her AP Art History class, but this might be something you refer back to because it helps us understand, again, how Baroque can become so regionalized. I talked about this with Southern Baroque, right? And in Southern Baroque, we really looked at Italian and some Spanish, but, we will leave, but in this lecture, we're going to see a greater variety of the Baroque styles. Um, so you can see that everything highlighted in red gives us sort of a general overview of the key characteristics of each region in the Baroque style. So like I said, this might be something useful to refer back to um, or copy down in your notes in some way. And here is a map to remind us of the uh, geographical makeup of Europe in about the mid-17th century, which is more or less the time frame that we're looking at. The Thirty Years' War has just ended, so the Holy Roman Empire has become very decentralized. It's definitely on the decline as a political institution. France is on the rise as it consolidates royal power to establish absolutism. England's been having a bit of a hard time with its civil war. Spain, as we recently learned, is on the decline. And in Eastern Europe, we're going to start to see the emergence of some of those new empires like Brandenburg, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. But we'll mostly be focusing on art in Western Europe from France, from the Netherlands, from England, and places like that. Okay, we're going to start with our first region, uh, and that is going to be Flanders. So this is going to be called Flemish Baroque. So this is from the region known as the Spanish Netherlands or Flanders or modern-day Belgium. Three names, one place, basically. So it, this region is like the southern Netherlands. Remember that the northern provinces became Protestant and they broke away from Spain in the 16th century. Well, those southern provinces remained a Spanish possession and they remained loyal to Spain and they retained Catholicism. So there is going to be more religious painting from Flanders than from any other region that we study in Northern Baroque. Flemish Baroque is known to have the combination of the extravagance and the drama of Southern Baroque, but also synthesized with some of the new developments of Northern Baroque. So it has, it, of all the Baroque genres, frankly, it is of, the, of all the Northern Baroque genres, excuse me, it is the one that is most similar to Southern Baroque. Um, it has the most Catholic influence, it's going to have the most drama and the emotion and the movement that we're used to seeing from Southern Europe. Now, Flemish Baroque is dominated by the artist Peter Paul Rubens. Sometimes this is called the Age of Rubens. And Rubens is one of the most prolific and famous and well-known painters in European history. Like I said, he will synthesize the styles and the concepts of Southern and Northern Baroque. He is very, very famous in his own lifetime, universally recognized as a genius and a savant. He's described as being outgoing and classically educated and handsome and vigorous and well-traveled and fluent in like six languages. And he had a really extensive workshop that produced over 2,000 paintings in his lifetime. He was strongly influenced by artistic techniques in the South. He spent considerable time in Rome, Italy, studying art from antiquity and also studying the art of Caravaggio. So we'll see a little bit of that Southern Baroque influence for sure. So we're going to look at three paintings of uh, Rubens and analyze them a bit and talk about them. So the first one here, this is called The Elevation of the Cross. 
And one of the things you probably are going to notice right off the bat on for Rubens paintings is that often the people in the paintings are almost like excessively, maybe even comically buff. You know, they're, you, we would say that they're swole, they're, they're thick, right? With like two, if not three C's type of thick. Um, people have described them almost as like lumpy. It's so, uh, it's so exaggerated. So this is obviously a Catholic scene. It's the elevation of the cross where Christ has just been nailed to the crucifix. The cross is raising up and uh, we can, it's easy to see the physical exertions of the muscular men to raise Christ on the cross. And this dynamic, uh, this diagonal line that you see here going across the middle of the painting, that is really common in Baroque art. It creates a sense of dynamic tension. And it's really important for the basic format of the composition because it creates a sense of being inherently unstable. Um, and it's really common in Baroque art. Like you might think back to Tintoretto's Last Supper and that diagonal line of the table in that painting. So we'll see it pretty frequently. This is also an example of how Baroque art sometimes breaks the fourth wall. It looks like if the men keep raising the cross then it would almost burst out of the painting and come towards us. We can also see that throughout the painting there's a sense of movement, a sense of struggle, emotion, despair as Christ's followers witness his execution, although Christ is still clearly the focal point. There's lots going on, especially since this is a triptych. Um, you know, on the, on the left panel, we see women grieving. On the right panel, we see Roman soldiers. So there's a lot of action going on in this painting. It's very, and the reason I chose this one as the first one is that it is most similar to a lot of these Southern Baroque themes that we have seen. So it should be the most familiar. The next painting, also very Catholic in nature, this is called The Descent of the Cross. So the last one was the, the Rising of the Cross. This is The Descent of the Cross. These are both in the same cathedral in Antwerp. And in this, we see that influence of Caravaggio, especially that theatrical lighting um, a very dark sky in the background, almost like a spotlight on the body of Christ. Uh, there is uh, evidence of tenebrism, T-E-N-E-B-R-I-S-M, that sort of spotlight technique that we saw from Caravaggio. There's also kind of a curviness and a softness. There's still a sense of instability, like this might remind you a bit of uh, Pontormo's uh, Mannerist paintings. But that instability is seen here and that curviness, right? So there's almost an elegance as Christ uh, sort of slumps down from the cross, right? You can see that, di that curviness right there. It's not the harsh diagonals that we saw in the last painting. Um, but still, this gives us a sense of energy and emotion and movement, right? There's the bright colors. This guy's red cloak really pops out as well. And of course, this is a tragic emotional theme. We as the viewer um, can relate to the figures and their, and the, and the, in the painting and their sadness. Um, and that's deliberate that this painting is trying to evoke that emotional response from the viewer. And then the next painting is one in a series. All right. So Peter Paul Rubens was commissioned to paint this elaborate series of paintings about the life of Marie de Medici. So Marie de Medici was the wife of Henry IV, the first Bourbon king of France, and she commissioned Rubens, so she hired him, to create this series of paintings about her. There's actually 21 of these large-scale oil paintings. They're huge. And this is a really great example of how Rubens uh, is able to create glorious epics out of what is essentially not very glorious raw material. Like the life of Marie de Medici was not that amazing. So here is one um, 
one painting from that whole series. It's when Marie de Medici arrives at Marseille to, to meet and marry uh, Henry IV. And the reason I chose this, chose this painting is because, again, there's a really good example of the type of body image that Rubens supports. So earlier we saw those excessively muscular men and the bulging muscles, and it was kind of lumpy. Well, here we see uh, the female image. So down below, these are considered to be sea nymphs. And again, those women are kind of thick, right? Um, but this is uh, demonstrating a different uh, a uh, sort of body image and body ideal. So in the 17th century, and really throughout much of history, a woman with more junk in the trunk, frankly, you know, who was thicker, and fatter was considered beautiful. Um, that's because that meant that they were healthy and they were going to be able to like survive and, 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 and push out some babies basically. So big is beautiful, um, especially in a Rubens painting. So this also has a lot of the traditional, you know, pomp and circumstance of Southern Baroque, the exuberant colors, the rich costumes, the drama. Again, even though this isn't really a dramatic thing, it's Marita Medici getting off a boat, but we have angels blowing horns, and we have sea nymphs dancing in the waves, and we have other Roman creatures. That's a triton, so that might be like Poseidon or something like that. Um, it is a big deal that this queen is getting off the boat, right? So at least that's how he makes it appear. Okay, moving on to our next painter. This is Anthony Van Dyke. He is also Flemish Baroque. And he's a very interesting character. You'll see already that his style is very different from Rubens. So first, let's do a little bit of background on Anthony Van Dyke. So he was considered to be a child prodigy uh, painter. He worked with Rubens in the studio in Antwerp, where R Rubens mostly lived and worked throughout his life. And Anthony van Dyck eventually became the court painter to Charles I of England. And Anthony van Dyck had quite the reputation. He was nicknamed Il Pittore Cavalersco which basically means in Italian, the painter who gives himself fancy airs. So this means he was a bit of a dandy. So he was snobbish, he was bougie, he was addicted to high society, he dressed ostentatiously, so that means like really fancy. So he's He's just kind of like ridiculously fancy and self-assured. I used to call him like the Kanye of, of, of European artists, but Kanye's gotten like super religious now and is like really toned down his aesthetic. He's not quite as outlandish as he used to be. So I'm not sure if that's still a, a relevant comparison this year. Anyways, Anthony Van, Anthony Van Dyke specialized in portraiture and he sort of enlivens his portraits. He transforms what could be very frosty, stoic, official images of royalty to be more approachable. It's more like they're real human beings. And his portraits often have this sense of arrested movement. It's like the subject is pausing rather than posing which creates a more sense of humanity, and it also is really more of a flattering portrayal of subjects. So think of it as like you're taking a picture. There's posed pictures, and then there's candid pictures. And candid pictures, which are taken like in the moment, are usually more attractive and feel like they're more lively and authentic rather than posed pictures. So you can think of his, his portraiture as being more candid. So let's look at a couple of his paintings. This first one here, this is called Samson and Delilah. This is a biblical theme um, in, uh, in the painting. And so this demonstrates the more traditional influence of Rubens, not only with the religious subject matter, but also with imagery, the motion, the drama. Although you can see it's not quite as polished as Rubens. He has a more uh, sort of kind of natural, earthy style than Rubens. I'm going to go back to this previous portrait here. This is his self-portrait with a sunflower. 
And while this uh, portrait demonstrates a sense of naturalism, it also shows off how he was kind of a, a dandy. Like he's wearing this pink silk shirt with a gold chain. And it's, it's, it's almost kind of comical. I used to say it's like he's out here in the field sniffing this ridiculously oversized sunflower and someone's walked up behind him and he just turns and he's like, oh, you just caught me sniffing the sunflower. Like it's just, it seems kind of silly and, and almost a little too contrived in my opinion. Like, oh, excuse me, while I sift this sunflower, how are you? Sorry to that I, you know interrupted this moment I had with the sunflower. Anyways, uh, one of his most famous paintings is this one here. This is, again, a great example of how he was the court painter for Charles I. This is one of the most famous portraits we have of Charles I of England. It's called Charles I at the Hunt. And this is another example of how he's sort of humanizing and enlivening his subjects. In this painting, Charles I is portrayed as a dashing cavalier with that tipped hat and long, luxurious mane of hair and those red pants and the hand on the hip and his cane. He's out with the horses on a hunt. So again, he's this dashing cavalier when in reality, Charles was described as being kind of stubby and plain and unattractive. The Louvre describes this painting as a subtle compromise between gentlemanly nonchalance and regal assurance, which is a very complex way of saying that he's relaxed. All right. Um, so again, this is one of his most famous paintings of Charles I, which is both flattering, but also supposed to be more realistic and making him a more approachable, natural monarch that he just happens to be on a hunt that we've encountered. Okay, moving on to Dutch Baroque. So Dutch Baroque is an incredibly prolific genre. I mean, there are just hundreds of painters, thousands upon thousands of Dutch paintings. This is usually a love it or hate it genre among art history fans. So Dutch Baroque refers actually to the Dutch Republic, you know, the United Netherlands, the northern provinces that had broken away from Catholic Spain and become an independent Protestant country. Now, one important thing to know about uh, Dutch art is that the Calvinist culture that dominated the Netherlands prevented what we call iconoclasm. That's spelled I-C-O-N-O-C-L-A-S-M. And iconoclasm refers to the use of images, meaning religious images in art. So again, most Catholic art has lots of religious imagery of Christ and Mary and the saints and biblical scenes, but, but Calvinists, um, deliberately rejected that. They they had a, a, a they, religious art was strictly forbidden in Calvinist regions and countries. So that means in uh, in the Netherlands there was no patronage from the church, the Catholic Church or the Calvinist Church or any other church. There was no patronage from the royal courts because it was a republic. And there was no patronage from the nobility because there really was not a there really was not a traditional nobility in the Netherlands. Instead, the Netherlands were primarily made up of a really prosperous middle class of merchants, kind of like a bourgeoisie, who commissioned and collected art. So this is this has been described as a way of democratizing art. So we're democratizing art. We're making it more accessible in both subject matter and also in ownership. So obviously we're going to see a lot of safe secularism in Dutch art, but we're also going to see uh, a lot of support for this art. That's why there's so, this is why it's such a prolific genre. There's also really high demand for paintings during the golden age of the Dutch Republic because, again, art um, could communicate status and wealth. Although Dutch art was not very public, this Dutch art was displayed in the home. And so as a result, lots of Dutch art is, more, is smaller in size, it's more intimate. Um, if you go and look at a lot of this Dutch painting in uh, in museums, you'll see that it's usually really small, much smaller than we're used to seeing, especially with some of this 
uh, Italian Baroque and Southern Baroque art. And like I said, lots of safe secularism. The subjects of Dutch Baroque usually include still life and landscape paintings scenes from domestic life. They really celebrated domesticity. We'll see some examples of that and also scenes with animals. So the most famous of the Dutch artists really uh, is probably Rembrandt, Rembrandt van Gen. Um, he's really one of the most famous painters in the entire Western world and his art is is really really exceptional. It's It's been described as like just perfect in its detail and its realism. However, Rembrandt's life was marked by tragedy and debt. Even though he was really famous throughout his life, he had several children die in infancy, and his wife then would die after childbirth, uh, which was very tragic. And Rembrandt, again, while famous earlier on in his life, um, this tragedy prompted a transition in his style. So his early style we will see is really uh, more traditionally Baroque. Uh, it has more dramatic lighting, more contrast, designs that seem to burst through the frame, lots of scenes that featured groups of figures, uh, scenes based on physical action, scenes that were more vigorous, they had a more melodramatic tone, and again, that highly finished, highly detailed technique. Those were all characteristics of his early style. But then as we transition into his later style, we can definitely start to, to glean that sense of tragedy. There's more of the golden brown tones, more subtle shading. His uh, later art is described as having kind of a static or brooding, that means kind of depressed atmosphere. The scenes are often simplified with a single subject and have a very quiet, solemn mood. And they're not as, as, as polished either. They often have broad, thick brush strokes that are more visible to the viewer. And this implies, again, the, his psychological reaction to all the tragedy in his life. And in fact, Rembrandt, at the end of his life, would be buried in, a, in an unmarked grave, and later the remains of his body would be destroyed. So it really is this, this really tragic transition that we see in his life. So we're going to look at two examples of Rembrandt's art, one from the early style, one from the later style, and definitely keep an eye out for those characteristics that I was just uh, talking about. So this first one, this is called the Night Watch, and this is again an example of early style. This demonstrated Rembrandt's exceptional technical skill with lighting and composition and, and the use of color, and this painting is largely considered a, a masterpiece in Western art. Uh, we also see some of that uh, more uh, characteristic Baroque technique with the dramatic lighting, the tenebrism, a use of something called uh, chiaroscuro, and I'll spell that for you. It is C-H-I-A-R-O-S-C-U-R-O, -S chiaroscuro. It's an Italian word uh, to describe the painting technique in which the painter uses color and shade to show dimensionality, to, so to show kind of a 3D effect. Now, even though this painting looks like it is set at night and it's called the Night Watch, it isn't actually set at night, but that is an example of how the, uh, that dramatic lighting that we commonly see in Baroque art. And this is also a different approach to the group portrait that was usually portrayed in the time. There is a greater sense of movement and communal action, more hectic activity, and also that idea that the painting might be breaking the fourth wall, that these men are about to step out of the painting and into our lives. Now, for the painting on his, about his later style, we're actually going to go back to this slide here and look at the self-portrait. So Rembrandt painted almost 40 self-portraits over his career. Um, the number of portraits was actually originally thought to be higher, like closer to 100, but recent scholarship has discovered that his students actually copied many of his self-portraits 
as part of their training. But his self-portraits are very introspective, meaning they're very revealing, they're very intimate, and they show, uh, you know, but really without any sugarcoating, his age and his depression and his transition in life. And his, por his portraits and self-portraits have a very distinct style where the subject is seated as an angle, the face is often partially eclipsed, and the nose is sort of like this bridge that divides the lighting. So you'll see that the, the, the subject of his portraits are almost always seated in the same position and same way. And this particular one also shows the golden and brown hues and kind of that more dark, depressed mood, a sense of kind of brooding duskiness in the painting is how it's been described. Anyway, moving on to a more cheerier subject with Franz Hals. So Franz Hals is another famous Dutch painter, and he has been called the master of the moment. The master of the moment, because it's almost like he is able to capture a fleeting expression in his artwork. And his trademark were portraits of men and women in moments of high spirit. So he kind of has, has what I call happy portraits, happy portraiture. It's exciting. It's fun. It's very Instagrammy, if you will. And these outgoing merry portraits reveal his gift for enlivening rather than embalming a subject. So giving his subjects life and vitality and personality rather than making them seem almost like, it's almost like a gravestone in a way, is how he, he saw a lot of traditional portraiture. Franz Hals was also famous for what is called the Alla Prima technique. So that's spelled Alla, A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, and then the second word is Prima, P-R-I-M-A, Alla Prima. And this is a technique where the artist applies paint directly to the canvas without an undercoat. So traditionally, um, artists would paint the canvas with an undercoat of paint. But without that, we call that a la prima. So the painting is more is completed with a single application of brush strokes. This means the brush strokes are often more vis visible. It gives the painting more texture. It's a little bit like more natural in a way. It's not as polished because Franz Hals believed that some artists that maybe like the ones we just studied um, painted their subjects to death because it was too polished and too perfect. And his technique was also influenced by Rubens and Van Dyck. So they also were sometimes known to use this a la prima technique. So this first painting here, this is called The Laughing Cavalier. And it's described as a sly figure with a smile on his lips, a twinkle in his eyes, and an upturned mustache. And there's kind of a swashbuckling effect here that is, is really achieved through the brush strokes, through that a la prima technique. Um, but again, we see sort of this happy, almost mischievous uh, cavalier type guy. The next, next painting we're looking at from Franz Hals is called The Banquet of the Officers of the St. George Guard Company, or Officers of the St. George Civic Guard. And this is another sort of atypical approach to the group portrait. Um, the traditional group portrait often resembled like an elementary class photo. Like think about your elementary class photos where you had to all stand on risers looking forward. It's very posed. It's very stiff. Well, Franz Halls is transforming those stiff conventions of group, port group portraiture. Uh, instead, these subjects are seated around a table in relaxed poses. They appear to be interacting naturally. They also have individualized facial expressions. Um, so again, there's that sense of individualism and humanism here. There's also those diagonal lines here with the banners which is common in, uh, in Baroque composition. Um, there's a sense of the fourth wall being broken. Again, it's this guy. It looks like he's, he's you know, talking to us, the viewer. So we feel like we're a part of this banquet, basically. So again, another example of how Franz Halls is able to capture um, 
you know, this sort of lively, happy portrait. Now, one of the most famous of the Dutch artists, I'd say second to Rembrandt, is Johannes Vermeer. And Vermeer is considered to be a master of light. So a master of light. Franz Hals was the master of the moment. Vermeer is the master of light. And his talent and technique is considered second only to Rembrandt in the Dutch tradition. But in comparison to Rembrandt, his colors are brighter. They're purer. They seem to glow with a greater intensity. His paintings are described as perfectly balanced compositions of rectangular shapes that lend serenity and stability to his paintings. One of the phrases I really like is that they are described as quiet paintings. So just think about that, a quiet painting. Vermeer has a keen representation of visual reality. The colors seem to be perfectly true to the eye, and there's a soft light that seems to fill the room with radiance. It's very natural. Again, one of the uh, descriptions I've seen about Vermeer's work and his use of light, and this is, I quote, soft butter light roams over various surfaces in the paintings. So it's, it's like soft butter that roams over the surfaces. It's also been described as crushed pearls melted together. Now, he often varied the intensity of the color in his painting in relation to an object's distance from the light source. Uh, that's another example of chiaroscuro, so creating a more realistic dimension to the painting. And his technique was didn't have the sort of thick brush strokes that we saw some from, say, Franz Halls and others, but he applied paint in dabs and pricks, so almost like little short brush strokes that often raise the surface of the point of the paint so that reflected more light. Um, it's not as, as specific as, say, the pointillism of the Impressionist, but it's smaller, shorter, more dabbier brush strokes. So this painting here, this is called The Kitchen Maid, and as I described sort of a general theme of Vermeer's paintings, hopefully you were able to recognize some of those qualities and characteristics in this painting. So this is a, a domestic scene. Um, Vermeer is really famous for his domestic scenes, and there's often a window in his scene and then a single person engaged in some type of action. So one of the cool things about this painting is how subtle the light is. For example, look at the rim of this milk jug here, and we can see how the light uh, is sort of picked up on where the, the, the rim here, where the milk would be, um, or the light is also picked up on the crust of the bread here in front of her. Uh, there's lots of attention to detail from the stitching in her dress that you can see here to the imperfections on the wall and of course the use of light. This area is darker because we know that the light would not would not reach that as much so this area next to the window is darker and then it gets lighter as it goes farther out and the light reaches farther. And this is overall a really balanced and cohesive composition. It's very calming and while it's devoid of dramatic incidents, so there's nothing really dramatic or big and bold happening, but at the same time, this the maid's absorption in her task, like she's so focused on pouring this milk, it gives it a sense of, of elegance, right, and majesty, even though it is ultimately a very simple topic. Now his next painting is really famous. You've probably seen it before. This is called Girl with a Pearl Earring. And some, so, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, um, but this is one of the few portraits, uh, like pure portraits, that Vermeer painted. Um, we really do not know who this girl is, but this is, ex this is meant to be a more exotic painting. Uh, she's actually wearing a turban. This headpiece is a turban. Oops, sorry. I went ahead there too much. So this is considered a turban. Um, and also this blue color on the turban, this is called Prussian blue, is a very distinct blue color used in Dutch paintings. And this blue color was difficult to achieve, and so 
this color was a way of demonstrating the wealth and the access to trade that the Dutch had. And we can see it also used here in the milkmaid painting as well, the kitchen maid painting. Okay, moving on to our last topic. This is French Baroque. So French Baroque is going to have more of a classical influence than many of the other forms of Baroque. It's almost a revival of classicism in the way. And it also demonstrates the shift in the center of the art world in the 17th century. Up until this point, Rome and other places in Italy were seen as the center of European art. But in the 17th century, we see that uh, shift up to Paris and France. And this represents the general transition and the balance of power that we see in the 17th century where essentially what had been more the what had been more power in northern in southern Europe is giving way to northern Europe. So so that's that follows a sort of cultural and political trend of the century. And again, French Baroque art uh, adopted more classicism and, and classic techniques. It rejected a lot of the traditional Italian Baroque style as being overly showy and sort of like it, like too extra and too luxurious and opulent. Um, and French Baroque is often, uh, in regards to patronage, associated with absolute monarchs. So the absolute monarchs will play a major role in French art, but that also means they're going to have a lot more control over the type of art that is created. So French Baroque is often associated with the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture and it was founded in 1635 by Cardinal Richelieu, who you might remember from an earlier lecture. And this became like the, the, the preeminent uh, artist's academy, painting academy of, of, of Europe. And in fact, they created um, a, a prize for up and coming artists. It was called the Prix de Rome, and Prix de Rome is spelled P-R-I-X, Day is D-E, and then Rome, I'm going to assume you know how to spell. And this was a prize for up-and-coming artists that allowed them to study in Rome. It's kind of like you won a study abroad scholarship to Rome, Italy. Um, but this is a way to educate and train young artists. And in general, the, the French Royal Academy really emphasized quality control. Um, their desire was to professionalize the artists and ensure high standards. And that's one of the reasons they would send up and coming artists down to Rome is because they wanted them to be well versed in classical art. And so artists would study classical sculpture and architecture and things like that. So like I said, the theme of French Baroque is really classicism, French classicism. So we're on that third bullet point now. There's a very strong influence of classical tradition. So this artist draws a lot on the same things of the th same themes of the Italian Renaissance, both in its style and its subject matter. So that means there's going to be a lot more Greco-Roman uh, mythology and imagery than we have seen. Uh, but there's also going to be some biblical scenes because France was, of course, very Catholic. French Baroque and French Classicism often has a very linear masculine style. There's an emphasis on clarity, on simplicity, balance, and harmony. Again, this classicism sort of represents a rationalism of the human mind. And so they consciously reject the emotionalism and the high drama of the Baroque art we might see in Italy or in Flanders. And this really is going to lead into another art genre that we study that's more prolific called neoclassicism, which basically means new classicism. And that's an art genre of the later 18th century that is associated with the Enlightenment and French Revolution. So we're going to look at two artists in the French Baroque tradition um, and their paintings. We're unfortunately not going to take time to explore Versailles, although you definitely could Use the Palace of Versailles as one of your art history samples, but I think you're already quite familiar with Versailles at this point. So one of the most preeminent artists of this period was Nicolas Poussin. He was a French artist initially based in Rome, and so 
A lot of his paintings uh, depict ancient Roman myths or the history and, uh, and architecture of Rome, of the city of Rome. And so again, we see that strong classical influence. And his success uh, as an artist would help to revive the themes of antiquity so that it would really become the dominant sort of artistic theme and influence for the next 200 years. And in fact, in the French Royal Academy, artists were trained in what was called Poussinism, um, which is basically Poussin's name with an ism at the end, Poussinism. And this was a way of institutionalizing those themes and those techniques of classicism. So this is very different from Rubens, obviously. Rubens was more of a naturalist. He embraced that emotion and that drama. And Poussin rejected that. He's more of a classicist. And Poussin also only painted subjects that are part of what is called the grand manner. So the grand manner, they want to write that down. The grand manner is basically like important subjects, grandiose, important, noble subjects and narratives in paintings. So that means the paintings are going to have battles, heroic actions, religious themes, things that are important and worthwhile. Poussin did not believe that artists should waste their time painting lowly subjects like peasants and and things like that, or even featuring uh, lowly subjects as their models, like Caravaggio. In fact, Poussin detested Caravaggio and his work. So let's look at a few examples of Poussin's paintings. This one here is called The Death of Germanicus, and again, it is a great example of classical themes and that grand manner style. So this scene is a huge moment from Roman history. It's the death of the Roman general Germanicus, which was a huge tragedy. Germanicus was thought to possibly become an emperor. He was beloved by the Roman people and the Roman legions. Um, he was father to uh, some uh, the later Roman emperor Caligula. That's actually Caligula, this little child here in the painting, and it's largely expect, uh, suspected that Germanicus was poisoned. So there's a lot of really interesting history behind this painting. But again, here we have a great man dying in the middle of a great imperial period that defines Western civilization. And you can see that linear masculine style, the classical technique. Of course, there is some emotion, but nothing like the drama and craziness of a Rubens painting. And this painting here is even more subdued. This is a landscape that depicts with, with the depiction of uh, a Greek myth called Orpheus and Eurydice. And so we have Orpheus and Eurydice down here. This is these are the subjects of the uh, of the of the myth. And this is also set in the Roman countryside. This building back here is not just some random castle. This is actually the Castle San Angelo, which is like the papal fortress, which you can still see in Rome today. Um, so this would be about as normal as a painting as uh, Poussin would produce. Uh, again, he didn't do a lot of landscapes, but this still features a Greco-Roman theme, which sort of legitimizes the importance of the landscape and also shows his affinity for Roman architecture with Castle San Angelo in the background there. And then finally, we are going to finish with the artist Claude Lorraine, who more, is known more commonly as just Claude. And Claude was um, strongly influenced also by the classical traditions of the Italian Renaissance and antiquity. Uh, and he's really known for um, landscapes and paintings that depict like the Italian countryside. He was really more inspired by nature rather than the strict classicism of Poussin. And his paintings um, often have a nice balance to them. So they may have a dark majestic trees forming a partial arch to frame the painting, um, or there's more of a balance in the paintings. Like this one, we see a uh, seaport at sunset. And you can see that there is um, a clear focal point with the sunset. 
and the use of more classical architecture kind of creating that vanishing point. And again, that's really common in Italian Renaissance, right? The idea of that vanishing point to create that three-dimensionality. And you'll see that the humans really aren't the focus of the painting. In fact, it's been said that Claude had no interest in painting humans. Uh, supposedly, if they do appear in his paintings, like they, like we see here, it's because he paid other artists to, to, to draw them in, basically. Um, but what's really noticeable about this painting, of course, is the natural light and the landscape and the balance um, of the painting and image. This one here, this is called Sunrise, and this is another great example of, of his use of big trees, um, kind of representing uh, a way to frame the painting, the architecture, it's our trees instead of actual architecture. And this is also the Roman countryside. Again, the, the people in the painting are small and insignificant. Really the focus here are the, is, is the landscape and the sort of the majesty of nature. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture on Northern Baroque art. Um, any of the artists we covered here are going to be fair game for your art history sample, and we'll discuss the expectations for that in class soon. Have a wonderful evening.